I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. The Line is sponsored by Pop Menu, which helps turn first-time guests into regulars for your restaurant. For a limited time, get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash HRN. This episode is brought to you by Honeycomb Credit. Heritage Radio Network listeners can learn more about the power of community capital by visiting honeycombcredit.com slash HRN. This week on Meet and 3, we're celebrating the food culture of South Carolina with its chef ambassadors. Oh, I'm super excited that it's soft shell crab season. <laughs> Those little suckers are delicious. People think, oh, tomato is a tomato. No, there is a, a good tomato and a bad tomato. So when they come to, to Hampton or even, you know, even in South Carolina, you can really find a incredible ingredient. We started getting lettuce from Micro Leon Farms in Conway. He's it's a, a super sweet family that runs that little farm. Tune in to Meet and 3, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Eli Sussman, and this is The Line on Heritage Radio. Today's guests are Darren and Charlene Lopez-Young, the owners of the Fatted Calf based in St. Louis. When Fatted Calf started as a once-a-month pop-up, Charlene and Darren were exploring the dream of so many food entrepreneurs. They thought maybe one day they would open up a brick-and-mortar restaurant in St. Louis. While they kept their day jobs, they worked on growing the pop-up brand, garnering excitement and fans around the St. Louis area. Then when the shutdown occurred, like with so many other food businesses, Charlene and Darren had to discuss pivoting and had to talk about making tough decisions on what they would end up doing with the fatted calf. They had big dreams for the business, and then the shutdown occurred. So without in-person pop-ups driving revenue, they tried combined feasts to-go boxes, but it just did not generate anywhere close to the revenue of their in-person pop-ups. So together they developed a new plan to push forward with their line of longanisa sausages. Longanisa is a Filipino-style sausage that is commonly served for breakfast with fried rice and a fried egg. Quarantine led to everyone cooking a lot at home, and their sausages have taken off in the St. Louis area. With the focus now on the sausage company, they have big hopes of expansion and growth. So what began as a Filipino barbecue pop-up has become a Longanisa sausage company during the pandemic. On today's episode, we talk about incubators and business accelerators, when to make the decision to leave your traditional job behind to start your own business and run it full time, the embrace of the St. Louis food community, and the difficulties faced as a minority-owned business. Now, on to the episode. Before the pop-up, what were you doing? And did the pop-up start as a result of COVID or... uh, was it just either fortuitous or bad timing that you started the pop-up during COVID? Yes. Um, so what we didn't mention is uh, we sell Filipino longanisa. Um, it's a, a smoked sausage uh, in Schnucks grocery stores. Um, and that actually was birthed out of the pandemic. Um, but we started off as a pop-up just doing uh, Filipino barbecue and um, smoked meats out of uh, Earthbound Beer. Uh, we started as a uh, just kind of as a once a month pop up, and then um, it transitioned to a a weekly pop up. And when the shutdown happened, um, we thought through, you know, like, hey, what are we going to do? Um, how are we going to pivot? Uh, how are we going to grow? Uh, it seemed like COVID hit just at the worst time possible. Um, I think the the our last pop up before the shutdown, um, we served. Uh, we were actually just on a once a month rotation, um, but we sold out of three hundred plates in like under two hours. Uh, it was just pure chaos, <laughs> um, but we were just so excited with um, 
the business growth and and what we saw that the business could be, what it was becoming. Um, and then COVID hit. Yeah, I felt like we were at the peak, like we were just barely getting there. And the shutdown happened and we lost we we lost a few to sixty percent of our revenue. Um, we tried to do takeout. We tried to make it um, as f- COVID friendly as we could. Um, we did these Kamayan boxes, which was Filipino feast in basically a pizza box. Um, but we still were only getting fifty percent of what we would have been making if we did a full on pop up. So. Um, Darren went in the kitchen and started doing some test recipes for Filipino breakfast sausages called Longanisa, um, started selling that at Earthbound. Um, and that was doing really well because people could cook at home. People could, people were still grocery shopping during the pandemic. If ever people were grocery shopping so much during the pandemic, um, just to have some storage of food in their home, um, And then we got this email from um, a local grocery store here called Schnucks um, from a guy named Andy Deco, and I thought it was a scam. (laughs) So I didn't respond. And my husband, like a few hours later, was like, hey, are you going to respond to that guy? And I was like, no, it's like one of those that's like lost relative. They're going to mail me a thousand whatever. Um, And he was like, no, no, I think that's real. So I looked him up on LinkedIn, didn't find anything. And I was like, I told you it was fake. Um, but then um, they emailed us again and asked if we can get on a call. And I was like, oh, this might be real this time. So out of nowhere, we had this incredible opportunity to partner with a local grocery store in St. Louis selling ready to eat meals, um, fully cooked, packaged, uh, labeled, um, items, uh, on the, on a store shelf. Um, I I think that the actual term for it is consignment inventory where they will, um, just give us a shelf and we would pay them a very small fee to put our items there. And uh, this was just a local restaurant initiative by Schnucks Grocery Store uh, to save the, the restaurants in the midst of COVID. But specifically um, um, black owned businesses or minority owned businesses they wanted to have at the grocery store. And Schnucks is like 111 stores throughout Missouri and Southern Illinois and like certain other areas. So it's, it's a pretty large grocery store in the Midwest. Yeah, this is true. This is true. They, they also sought us out. So they had, you know, heard about us, did a little research on us and really kind of invited us into this process. And, uh, you know, as Charlene said, we, she was definitely on the fence, uh, but I said, Hey, you know, maybe this is a really good opportunity to stretch and grow the business. And right now we're really not doing much uh, in the pop-up scene uh, with the shutdown. Uh, Earthbound beer had just closed. Uh, I mean, I mean, they were, Pretty much closed. It's a brewery. um, And basically, I mean, their whole livelihood was interaction and community. And when COVID happened, that was totally cut off. They were selling beer through this to-go window, which was really great for them that they even had a to-go window at a brewery. Um, But we could only have so many people in the building um, in terms of staff. And then we couldn't definitely couldn't allow people to sit inside the brewery. So that was very limited, um, revenue opportunity. So let me ask about the, the actual product, because there is plenty of pop-ups in restaurants and they make something and someone says, that's so delicious. You should sell it in the store, but going from the point of producing, really anything, a sauce, a meat product, a dip, and then getting it into a grocery store. Can you walk me through the steps that you took to do that? Also, uh, is it safe to say that putting a meat product in a store is maybe the most complex thing that you could do because of packaging and keeping it cool? It sounds like you went from running a pop-up, which is very difficult, but maybe manageable to opening a a completely different company <laughs> during the pandemic. Uh, 
it sounds confusing. So if you can walk me through the steps of how, what you did to take it, um, to make it a finalized product and then getting it on the shelf, if you can just uh, sort of summarize those steps a little bit. Absolutely. Um, if you asked us, maybe like <laughs> at the beginning, we're like, we have no idea. We are learning with you. <laughs> but yeah, now. Yeah, Eli, it was an incredibly complex process. And, um, you know, a year ago it was actually almost uh, an exact year ago where we started this process. And we were really just reactionary based on what Schnooks was telling us, what they were uh, requiring of us, what they were asking of us, what were some of the uh, safety protocols out there. Um, I will say because we were doing this um, through the Schnooks local initiative, uh, there were some kind of loopholes that we were able to get into um, that, you know, we didn't have to, we did not have to have a, a USDA label on our product. Um, but because of that, we were only able to sell just at Schnooks, just at our science shelf and nothing else. So we were very limited uh, in what we were able to do. Um, but uh, the process of getting our product there included uh, creating a, a high set plan. It um, meant identifying some of the safety protocols when, you know, manufacturing food in a small kitchen. It included uh, doing tons, tons of different test batches and really trying to perfect this recipe. Uh, the reason why we actually ended up focusing in on the sausage was because most of our ready to eat meals, you know, our chicken barbecue dishes, our pork barbecue dishes, they would have maybe a three to four day shelf life, um, where smoked sausage had a two week shelf life. Um, so, uh, the way we started it was really just trying to practice and perfect the recipe. I really had, I maybe, uh, we maybe had uh, the longanisa on the menu for two times um, at two pop-ups before getting it into Schnook's grocery store. Um, and I, I reworked this recipe at least a dozen times uh, before I felt comfortable uh, for us to start stocking it at Schnook's. But what we would do, we would put our smoker on a trailer. We would pull it right behind earthbound. Um, we would um, uh, process our meat. We would grind it, season it, cure it. Uh, we would let it let it cure for uh, twelve hours, oftentimes overnight, um, and then we would stuff it. Uh, and we would oftentimes do fifty, sixty pound batches and by at a we, time. He means me and him. Yes, that's true too. We, <laughs> we it's literally it was just us in the kitchen sometimes till like one in the morning, Eli, because we would have to stuff at least 80 pounds of sausages and then cut it and then go through the process of smoking it for a few hours and then direct cooling um, because you have such a short time to cool the meat. And when you're talking about food production for a grocery store, the those are so important. Like every cooling temperature, every process, make sure that it's a safe food to get to the grocery store. At a pop-up, you cook it, you serve it, right? You serve it super hot. Um, it eliminates like, all the other steps that you have to do for cooling processes. But um, so it was just a very, very long process. Um, and anyone who has never made sausage before isn't aware that it is one of the most difficult, stressful, complex things that you can do in a kitchen. You, they burst. Uh, they, you have, you can run into filling problems. You can like, you can lose some of the yield because of all the things that you've mentioned already. So, um, now that you've, you've kind of got it up and running, is there a feeling that this is the future trajectory uh, for both of you? Is this a is this a COVID uh, side gig that you want to maybe pursue in tandem with the pop up again? Or are you thinking to yourself, "This is where we're going. We need to find a co packer. We need to expand. We need to take on investment." I guess where's your head at now that you've created a product line? Which maybe if I would have been interviewing you in February of 2020, we would have exclusively been talking about the direction of your pop up, but now we're talking about maybe both in tandem or, or one by itself. So, uh, what are you thinking now that that maybe we're emerging slightly from 
uh, under the the heavy weight of the quarantine. Well, 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 Eli, <laughs> we have a co-packer now, <laughs> so we are not the ones <laughs> making these sausages anymore. Thank God. <laughs> we have a co-packer with a USDA label. Yes, yeah, so we got finally approved by the USDA. <sighs> and that was six months worth of work. Eli. It was six months of being on the phone with the USD, uh, talking about what we could have on our label versus what we can't have on our label versus what we can have in our product to actually be able to call it uh, Filipino longanisa. They actually told us we could not call it Filipino longanisa because it was not made in the Philippines. We needed to settle for Filipino inspired. Um, but Filipino we were style. Uh, we were able to um, select the name Filipino style, but we had to find a Filipino chef uh, to authenticate our product and write a letter uh, proving that it was um, indeed Filipino. Yes, indeed Filipino. Because me being Filipino is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you don't you're not a because I'm not so, a chef, yes, right, or right. a licensed chef. Yeah. With a, a Luckily, degree, I so. have a cousin who is a Filipino <laughs> chef, so that was really helpful. So, um, the fattened calf has grown. Uh, the fattened calf has emerged, and uh, we are so much more than what we ever thought we would be. Um, we're bigger than just the pop up scene, um, and and yes, I would say uh, our focus is now going to be um, on the consumer good side of, of things for the business. Uh, it's going to be um, getting uh, our Longanisa um, in stores across the region and hopefully nationally. Um, so we have four different flavors. Um, we have sweet and spicy chicken, sweet and spicy pork, uh, sweet hamanado chicken, sweet hamanado pork, and then we have two uh, uh, smoked uh, garlic uh, savory sausages uh, in the pipeline as well, as well as a line of uh, Filipino barbecue sauces that we now want to do, uh, vinegar sauces, um, as well as Filipino uh, barbecue marinades uh, that we want to start getting uh, in the stores as well. So it's it's changed the game. It's changed the landscape for us. So you've really kind of opened yourself up to the idea that this is a this is a true company, which could be the future for your business. So when you when you think about what the next steps could be, you're in a grocery chain that's regional, but it has a lot of locations. What's the next step to appeal uh, or to get your product in front of a place like Whole Foods or a Target? Or uh, tell me what your what your dream locations are, and then do you hire someone to help you with that sales process? Do you now both become salespeople? Are you going to be doing demos in grocery stores? Uh, how do you how do you build continue to build your dream up? Because what it sounds like is you've got a great product that people are into, and you're developing more. So where do you go from here? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um... There's two different options for scaling the, <clears throat> the business. Um, we could go the food distributor route. Or we could go the food broker route. Well, three. And we could be, or we can be our own distributors. Um, and that's still something that we're processing and thinking through. Um, the more you involve people in the process, the lesser your profits are, right? Um, and that includes um, the profits for the grocery stores. If you have a food distributor, because there's like a middleman. Um, so it's a lot of studying, a lot of understanding our, um, where we can make the most profit, um, who we want to partner with, um, because that really matters. <laughs> that can make or break your business, um, which route you go. Um, finding the people that are passionate about not just food, but Filipino food as well, and getting that into mainstream grocery stores, because if you walk into your local grocery store, it's really rare that you'll find any Filipino products, but there's no shortage of Filipino Americans or Filipino immigrants in the United States. Um, so people that we want to work with who understand that that is such a big deal for myself as a Filipino American, um, who people who also understand that this is a black owned business and want to make sure that there are, there's representation in the grocery stores. Um, and that's a big deal for my husband. Um, so there's a lot of of things that we have to look up um, and and figure out. But um, Darren, do you want to share the other? Yeah, um, 
Dream locations. Uh, Costco. <laughs> uh, would love to be in Costco. Um, obviously, it's a wholesale store. Um, I grew up going to Costco uh, every week with my family and parents. So I, I, I kind of just have a, a a soft spot for that store. Um, um, <clears throat> but we would love uh, to expand. And our, our plan is to start regionally. Uh, specifically with schnooks. Uh, so we are still running our sausage through the local restaurant initiative, um, but we just, um, we're, we're close to uh, finalizing a deal with schnooks directly where they will buy the sausage from us. Uh, we'll find uh, someone to deliver the sausage to their warehouse, um, and then they'll take the rest um, of the process from there, which is what we want because right now um, we still have to act as our own distributors d- delivering our sausage to each store. Um, right now we're currently in nine schnook stores um, across St. Louis, Um, and, uh, we just, we don't have a big enough team right now to continue to do, uh, everything on our own. Um, so we're looking, uh, first and foremost for someone that can help us with distribution, uh, preferably even working with the grocery store itself first. Uh, so since we already have that relationship with Schnucks, um, we are trying to work with Schnucks, uh, directly, uh, without uh, kind of a middleman, um, we're, we're uh, we've just uh, our co-packer is actually going to deliver the sausage to Schnucks Warehouse, um, and uh, they'll work directly with us. For the other stores in the region, we do want to find uh, a food broker, um, someone that can represent us, represent our product uh, to some of these other grocery stores, um, and I think. What, what is our role now? Um, our role, what we want to be is uh, CEO and founders of this. So we do want to want to be the brand. Uh, we want to build the brand. We want to grow the brand um, in any way that we can. Um, and we also want to focus on the, the marketing side. So, uh, you know, once COVID restrictions are lifted, uh, you will see us. I hope you will see us in the grocery stores giving samples um, and telling more people about our business and what we do and what we want to do uh, for Filipino food in St. Louis. A lot of people that listen to this show are, uh, you know, starting off in the industry or they're, you know, a little bit younger and they're, they're maybe looking to do what, what you've done, which is start a business. So I want you to get um, as nitty gritty as you can while still maintaining your comfort level. When I ask you about um, investment and finances and how you got this thing off the ground. It's not the, the easiest thing to talk about, but I would love for you to share. Have you taken on investment? If you haven't taken on investment, are you self-funding this project right now? Or have you gone to a more traditional institution to try to uh, get to, to back this project? Um, and if none of those are the case and you've done something else, I would love to hear about how you intend to, uh, to grow the business. Um, and if you've put together a deck, uh, what are the steps that you have taken so that somebody who's listening who says, you know what, I, I think I want to make the jump. I've got a great product that I've been selling in my pop-up or through my restaurant. And I would love to do uh, what these folks have been doing. Um, give them a little insight into maybe the, the financial challenges that you've, that you've had to overcome just to get it, your product literally out into the world. Eli, um, we are young. <laughs> We're very young. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we are proud to say the fat and calf is debt free. Um, we have done this whole thing without incurring any debt. Um, we continue to run the pop up as best as we can. We've increased um, it to three times a month now instead of just once a month. Um, so that helped us um, with our salaries. Um, but the sausage um, business really. Um, the finances were backed um, through a grant. So we won this pitch competition. Um, we, As a minority-owned business, it's really hard to get um, loans, right, um, for your business. So we didn't even want to give that a try, and we also didn't want to go in debt. We didn't want to go through this whole thing owing people anything. So we looked at grants possible. Um, 
as a pop-up, we even did the same thing. We applied for this grant called the Balsa Grant um, and that we won a thousand dollars and the next thing was like five thousand. So we even approached our pop-up the same way. We learned about this grant through an UMSL accelerator. Um, accelerator programs are really great for people who are learning how to start businesses or do startups um, because they walk you through the process of what maybe a business school would do. Um, and if you don't have that background or if you're new to a network, they introduce you to people who do the same thing that you're doing or around the same business um, and connect you with mentors and introduce you to just people who have been doing it for a very long time. So there was a pitch competition for um, UMSL, which is the University of Missouri um, University uh, school here. <laughs> and um, we won. We were um, one out of six founders out of 400 something applicants. Um, and we got $50,000. Um, and in that $50,000, it came with eight weeks of intense mentorship um, and workshops um, where we just really sat and learned and absorbed every information that we can a lot while we're trying to build this business. So we had a lot of guidance and we had a lot of support, um, which is what we needed. We're transplants to St. Louis. We're from Los Angeles. Um, and so any sort of assistance and network we can get from people who have been doing the work here in the city in St. Louis and knows how the city functions was really, really helpful to us. Um, and so the $50,000 allowed us to get our co-packer, really take the time to do research and development, um, get um, like sausage stuffers so we can uh, expedite our, our sausage making process. Um, and um, our mentor helped us with a pitch deck in case we want to pursue investors later on. Um, we learn from accountants. We have an accountant now who helped us with our projections so that if we do sit in front of an um, uh, uh, investor, we can say like, hey, in four years, this could be worth $6 million. Um, and here is how. Um, so it really set us up well. Um, and, and we're still learning. Um, we're still very much connected to Accelerator, even though it's it's over with. Um, we developed lifelong partnerships and friendships um, through the process of building this manufacturing business. Um, and definitely, uh, I would I would say that what's really important is understanding that you don't have to do it by yourself, that there are people out there who are willing to invest and help you, even if it's not financially, people are willing to share what they've learned and sit down with you so that you don't have to go through the hurdles or the heartache that they've went through. Um, it's a, the food industry is a really tight knit industry and people are not really out there to get you. They're really out there to help you. We're going to take a quick break. Stick with us here on Heritage Radio Network. One of the difficulties of owning and managing a restaurant is there's too many third-party systems. There's just a loss of customer interaction. Introducing Pop Menu, the restaurant tool to turn more first-time guests into regulars. Pop Menu has an all-in-one toolkit for restaurant owners featuring dynamic menu design, automated remarketing, website hosting, analytics, and more. It gives full control back to the restaurant tour. Through the Pop Menu website or Pop Menu for Owners mobile app, you can interact directly with customers, select which reviews are shown, and make updates to the menu. There's no commissions, no setup fees, and one unchanging lifetime rate. Me personally, I always check the reviews before choosing a restaurant, and as a consumer, I'm more likely to choose a place that has lots of photos and good reviews. So if you're a restaurant owner, you need Pop Menu to take your business to the next level. For a limited time only, get $100 off your first month, plus you lock one unchanging monthly rate in. Go to popmenu.com slash HRN. That's $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash HRN. 
This episode is brought to you by Honeycomb Credit. Heritage Radio Network listeners can learn more about the power of community capital by visiting honeycombcredit.com slash HRN. We all know that food businesses like yours are the backbone of your community. You make your neighborhood a more delicious place to be, and your customers are hungry for more. Food businesses across the country are working with Honeycomb to open new locations, buy equipment, and grow. You too can unlock fair growth capital by allowing your community to invest directly into your business. A crowdfunded loan from Honeycomb deepens your customer relationships and gives them a whole new way to engage with your business. You'll also get access to thousands of local investors in the Honeycomb network who are passionate about seeing food businesses succeed. Honeycomb is the community bank of the 21st century. Fair rates, flexible terms, and no prepayment penalties. Honeycomb has proven to be an invaluable growth tool for all kinds of businesses, from James Beard-nominated restaurants and upstart food trucks to organic farms and award-winning breweries. Best of all, with Honeycomb, you're paying back your neighbors, not big banks. To learn more about how Honeycomb Credit can help grow your business while building vibrant, financially empowered neighborhoods, visit honeycombcredit.com slash HRN. Welcome back to The Line on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. We're going to jump back into the episode with Charlene and Darren Young discussing their Longanisa Sausage Company, The Fatted Calf. We're kind of all over the country. Well, at least Charlene. <laughs> uh, but we met in Los Angeles. Uh, we knew each other uh, from back home. Um, I moved to St. Louis to to work for the Salvation Army in their youth development um, center. Uh, so I have a background uh, in youth work, um, nonprofit work, community work. Um, so that's what brought me here to St. Louis. Um, and the Charlene, you want to share where, where you went after he dragged me here to St. Louis. <laughs> no, I actually was living in Australia um, pursuing my master's in international relations. And I was working in anti-human trafficking work. Um, but we were in a long distance relationship. And when I graduated, he had the opportunity to do a full-time job with an amazing organization here um, that does outreach to high school students in St. Louis City. Um, which, by the way, Darren still works full time. And I just left my full time job as a data analyst last September. So we were building this while we were working <laughs> crazy. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, but I knew that I wanted to move to St. Louis before Darren even decided that he was going to stay here for the long run. His heart was still in L.A., um, but I I had to make sure I wanted to move to St. Louis. I was leaving Australia, right? Like <laughs> that place is amazing. <laughs> and to come to St. Louis, which is like landlocked, um, middle America. Um, I'm the only Filipino within like the f- <laughs> six mile or 10 mile radius, it seems like. Um, so I really looked it up. I made sure to visit. And when I got a job here, I made sure that this is where I wanted to be. And I love, I love St. Louis. Um, having lived in different places and in, in many different countries, I would say that St. Louis is one of those places that I, I have no regrets coming to. Um, it's a great city, great for new businesses. I, we could never, I, I don't say we could never, but it would have been a lot harder um, to build the fattened calf um, in Los Angeles because it's already saturated with Filipino food businesses or um, the food industry. It's, it's so huge. But in St. Louis, there's room to grow. There's room to make a name for yourself. Um, there's room to still tap into networks and and be a part of the conversation. And St. Louis is really big right now on creating space at the table. And if there's no space, they will they will make they will build a longer table um, because of the leadership and that we have in the city. So that's been a really great experience. And I mean, we bought a house on on Cherokee Street, which is um, one of the most diverse locations in the city. Um, and, and there's a really great Mexican spot down the street. It reminds us of home, of being in LA. Um, and yeah, we really, really like it here. And we're pretty much here to 
So when did you arrive in St. Louis? I got here 2014. Darren got I here. I moved here 2011. 2011. So you've definitely been there for some time now. You have some serious roots there. Um, is there uh, is there a feeling that you've settled on home, or is there always kind of a itching for Los Angeles in the back of your minds? I hear what you say about it being a uh, a, a crowded food market, but you did uh, touch on the fact that there is not necessarily a large uh, a Filipino community in St. Louis, and there is one in Los Angeles. Is that something that could potentially draw you back to the West Coast? Also the beach, also <laughs> the sun, also, I mean, I, I lived in oh, LA, God. so I understand the, uh, the heartache of leaving Los Angeles, but um, do you feel like you've, um, like your roots are fully established deep in St. Louis, or do, do you never say never to maybe making another switch? I, I think St. Louis has become home to us, and I think this is this is our new life, this is our new community, and we want to... Um, invest here. We want to uh, build our roots here and we, we want to be able to do that without our hearts and our hope elsewhere. Um, but I think what continue, what, what may bring us back to LA is going to be our family. Um, I think that's probably been the biggest thing that we've grieved or mourned in maybe the last two years is the lack of having uh, family and close proximity to yeah. us. And raising our daughter alone. Um, she's turning two in May, and she's not been around family as often. I mean, obviously, because the pandemic as well. But even prior to that, it was, it was just difficult to always, you know, have to fly back. Um, but we've been um, grateful to have family, I mean, friends who've become family now in a really strong community here. But I um but I will say we are looking to bring our sausages to grocery stores in Los Angeles. We we want to um because it was home to us for so long. We just want to also feel like we have representation there. <laughs> so um we are working on that and you know who knows maybe maybe two weeks out of the month I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean we <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that wishful thinking. Uh, the One of the aspects of the last year that has been so uh, tumultuous is that part of the, the COVID experience is that uh, people that have been away from their families, you haven't been able to travel, right? And people that have been uh, used to, all right, I leave the house every day at 8 a.m. and I go to my job and then I come home is in a different experience working from home. Uh, it sounds like you all work a lot more jobs and a lot harder than most people. You've got a lot of things going on. How has uh, the quarantine experience of being, um, if not at home, at least not able to do as much, not able to do the pop-ups, not able to see your family, has it changed um either your perspective at all? Has it made you uh, more grateful for anything? Has it made you long for anything besides seeing your family? Um, just trying to get a little bit into your headspace over the last year of being um, running a business during COVID and, and basically running it probably from your home, it sounds like. I think first and foremost, the only reason the Fat and Calf is where it's at currently is because of covid um, because we had all that time. I mean, I remember, you know, my job um, just kind of shutting down. We do a lot of outreach uh, with high school students in the communities, even working, um, partnering with their schools. When the schools shut down, a lot of our programs shut down. Now, thankfully, I was still getting a salary, but I had so much time on our hands. I mean, I remember, you know, there's a, a month, month and a half period where I'm like, all right, I can't do Netflix for a, another day. Uh, we got to do something. So instead, you know, we started to work on the on test, test kitchen. We started to work on recipes. We started to uh, think through, well, what, what can we do um, for the fat and calf? Um, so COVID really, I guess, became an incubator for all these unique ideas that we had. Um, 
And oh, well, I gotta go get my daughter. Oh, that's 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 our that's our daughter. <laughs> um, I think COVID has taught us. Um, I think maybe we've seen just how important relationships are to us. Um, sustaining um, long term relate like close interpersonal friendships with folks. Um, we really miss our friends. Uh, we really miss being able to invite someone into our house for dinner. Uh, no mask, you know, not being worried about getting sick. Um, we used to run game night. We used to do game nights once a month in our house, dinner parties and game nights. Um, and actually out of that, that's how the fat and calf was burst because we would cook all this food and, and, you know, People said, hey, you should do something with this. Um, so I, I think COVID uh, in that sense has taught us just how much um, we care about our friends and relationships and having people over for dinner, uh, inviting people into our home um, and why that is so important to us. And uh, I, I think the more the more we're able to invest um into people here in St. Louis, um, the the less I feel like I miss home, um, the less I feel like, oh, man, you know, uh, we need to get out of the city. We need to go, you know, we need to go back. Um, and I'm really looking forward to just the upcoming year. Um, and, you know, we're fully vaccinated now. <laughs> um, so being able to have people over, uh, being able to share a meal at the dinner table um, without fear of, you know, what may happen due to COVID. The the St. Louis food scene that you become a part of, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, what the future of the St. Louis food scene will look like? Uh, d- did a lot of restaurants close because of, um, because of COVID? Did... Um, did the folks of St. Louis embrace, uh, restaurants and patronize them and, and go a lot because of, uh, you know, and go get takeout. Um, what are you seeing on the ground in St. Louis in the restaurant, in the restaurant scene and in the hospitality space? People were so supportive. People really went out of their way to make sure that restaurants could survive this. People were buying shirts. I think that's why the sausages sold really well in the beginning. Um, like anything, the gift cards, people were just supporting restaurants so many ways. And it was really great to see that. Yeah, I think um, a lot of restaurants we've seen close, uh, but we've also seen a lot of restaurants open up with very unique ideas. Um even as unique as just putting a takeout window. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think a lot of, uh, because of COVID, um, I think a lot of the future of food is is going to be, you know, takeout and, you know, those items that you can get delivered. Uh, so it's just even seeing a lot of just kind of innovative, creative ideas um, around that has been unique in St. Louis. Um, we've seen a lot more, um, even food trucks just open up, uh, because, uh, just due to COVID. So, so Darren, you have a full-time job, Charlene, you up until very recently had a full-time job, you have a pop-up and you have a consumer packaged goods company. Uh, are you, are you going to put layer something else onto that? Are you going to add another thing onto the mix? Is there a, a brick and mortar fat and calf ever in the future that you, that you're thinking about? Is that something that you say, we don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole or does it seem appealing to you to maybe have a, um, a brick and mortar where you could sell your packaged goods, but also have people come in and, and have a more traditional sit down meal? Appealing, not appealing? Oh, very appealing. I mean, it's it's the shiny rock in our eye, um, but one that we have to constantly remind ourselves to walk slowly um, and re- remember the vision, remember our goal here. 
um, because we we always wanted a restaurant, actually. Not always wanted, but at the beginning of the Fat and Calf, we said, yes, you know, we want a brick and mortar. We want a place where people can come, sit down, enjoy a, a meal together. Um, we're very much so about that. Um, but we also know that that might not be the most cost effective uh, thing in our lives right now uh, with me still having a full time job, with us having a two year old, with us also having a desire to have more kids in the future. Now, I think um, I think we both are in agreement that we want to put maybe the pause button on growing our family <laughs> uh, right now until we can figure out things uh, for the business um, grow our team a little bit more, have a little bit more sustainability, um, and figure out what, you know, maybe what my exit from my full-time job, uh, would look like right now. Um, I have, a, I get a really nice salary and full-time benefits insurance, you know, so that's a big deal, uh, for us. So it's, it, you know, that won't be a, a very easy decision to make that transition. Um, not, not yet at least. Um, however, um, right now, uh, we constantly have to remind ourselves to um, let's walk slowly. Um, I, I think maybe a brick or mortar uh, could be in the future. Um, maybe not so much the near future, but could be uh, later down the road. Um, but we are concerned a little bit about the overhead cost with that, a little bit concerned about our flexibility. The reason why we love the pop-ups is because our overhead cost um, is very low. Uh, we're very flexible with the schedule. Um, you know, we can take time off when we need to. Um, we'll be we'll be taking a two week vacation uh, to see our family first time within a year um, and sometime in mid June. Um, and we're able to say like, man, you know, shoot, let's take two weeks off. Let's take three weeks off. You know, we don't have to feel like, oh, man, you know, what are we going to do about the restaurant? You know, so being able to make those decisions right now um, is really nice. Um and then I think um, the, the biggest thing what it comes down to is the capacity issue right now um, um, because of capacity. Um, and you're right. We're, we're stretched. We're doing a lot. Yeah. So that's probably the, the one reason why we don't want to pursue a pop-up. I mean, a, a brick and mortar right now. Yeah, you've illuminated a lot of the challenges that uh, that one faces when they go in that direction. And having that flexibility and ability to be malleable is uh, is what a lot of people that have a brick and mortar are now want to do. Like COVID has made them see that not having that flexibility and being sort of tethered to your restaurant. Uh, makes it very difficult to uh, start another business or to go away and, and have some quality family time, which in the end is what most people are always trying to, to look for. Um, I do want to add, like, in, if you don't own your own building, you're putting in like at least $1,500 to $3,000 into a space, a rental space. That's St. Louis price. And, and that's St. Louis, right? <laughs> I mean, okay, but that's that's. A I think lot. everybody knew that that was St. Louis prices without you having to. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's more in like coast in the coastal areas, right? But like <clears throat> for the Midwest, if you're thinking Midwest money, three thousand dollars a month for a, a small business, that's, that's a, a lot. lot. You have to make sure that you are bringing in a lot more than three thousand um, dollars a month. Just to, and that doesn't include like your utilities. It doesn't include your staff. It doesn't include like you know if you have to fix something in the kitchen. If you if you're if there's no hood, that's another twenty five thousand dollars that you're putting in. I mean, it's just it's a lot to have a brick and mortar, and and we're at the phase where, um, where do we want to put our money? Like, where are we going to see the most return on our investments? Um, without the burnout, I don't want to work just to pay for my rent. I don't want to make money to put it back to someone else so someone else can make a profit off of us. Because the, right now, especially during COVID, what we bring in really, really matters. And so um, for folks that are planning to just jump right in to opening a restaurant in the midst of COVID, I would really caution and just say, like, really just think about it. What are the other assets in your neighborhood or resources around you that will allow you 
to open your business without you having to put down so much of your money to start off with. Um, and so those are really important things to consider in the midst of COVID, in the midst of starting your own business, opening up a restaurant, opening up anything. And I think just to add one more thing to that, you know, we want to be freed up to really be CEOs and founders um, of what we're doing with the sausage. Um, as you said, to not be tethered to a building. You know, we want we want to be able to uh, meet with grocery store execs. We want to be able to travel and spend two weeks, you know, in California to meet with co-packers and to do uh, sausage cutting, test batches and all of those things uh, if we need to. So um, that's kind of what our focus is on right now. And um, we're going to see where it's going to take us. So. You teed me up for my next question, which is uh, you want to be CEO and, and founder and you want to pursue uh, the growth of the company. So if I let you dream as, as big as you want to dream and I say five years from now, we're talking again, what are you telling me about where you are in five years? Oh, we're in Costco. We are in Costco in five years. <laughs> we are nationwide in five years. We will have, uh, we're in grocery stores in New York. We're in grocery stores in Los Angeles. And we're going to be telling you how difficult it was <laughs> to find co-packers in a state that you don't live in, to find distributors in a state that you don't live in, to have to constantly fly in and out of different places, managing a larger staff, um, definitely building a brand uh, or a market in a place that you're not familiar with. Um, those are probably what we'll be talking about. In five years, I would certainly like to see um, <clears throat> our sausage, our Filipino barbecue sauces, marinades, mm. um, Filipino style pickles uh, in mainstream grocery stores on the store shelf. Um, you know, if we go, even if we go to Schnucks, uh, uh, down the street and we go to their, their Asian aisle. Um, there's no Filipino products whatsoever, uh, but we would love to see our products there, um, even in Walmart, Yeah, Target. Yeah, Filipino food is good. We hope that more people bring it into their home and are comfortable to make um, longanisa for breakfast, just like they're comfortable to make breakfast for American breakfast sausages, right? or they're comfortable in making garlic rice or marinating their meats just like they are cooking maybe fried rice at home or ramen at home. So yeah, we want it to be a staple and definitely something that people want to experiment with and, and bring make a part of their family meals throughout the week. I wanted to ask about the name. What is the name in reference to? And, uh, and how did you come up with it? A name for any business is so important. Uh, it goes to me, it's name and then logo, right? So um, tell me a little bit about the name. What does it mean to you? How did you come up with it? Yeah. So the fattened calf, F-A-T-T-E-N-E-D, and then C-A-F, <laughs> no, no L, L. <laughs> short for cafe. Um, and, and our vision it's a, a fattier heftier version of a cafe experience um and this is when you know we obviously thought we were going to have a restaurant a small cafe where people can come um and just have the communal experience etc cetera, etc cetera. our vision is a little bit different now um but we still love the name the name has sticked um another reason why we uh, settled on that name is um because of the story um, of the prodigal son. Uh, the son comes back to his father. Uh, there's this huge celebration and there's this huge feast around the son returning. Um, and they, you know, they celebrate over this fattened calf. So to us, the fattened calf is Charlene and I putting our unique gifts and talents together, um, for the sake of our community, for the sake of camaraderie and coming together to enjoy in this big feast um, in the St. Louis community. And uh, it's something that we love. It's something that we're super passionate about. Uh, we're not chefs. We did go to one semester of culinary school. Um, <laughs> while I was pregnant. <laughs> yes. While like my was third pregnant. trimester. It was crazy, crazy experience. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's been a journey. Um, and it's so funny with our name, people say fatted calf or, you know, or they'll, they'll, they'll spell the whole calf, yeah, they'll, which they'll, is a fair, I mean, yeah. understandable, right, 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 right. But it's a great point of conversation. Yeah. People always, why, why no L? Well, it's a fattier, heftier version of a cafe. Yeah. You get rice, meat, some salads, like you're full when you come to this cafe. It's great. It can start a conversation and then you've, you've got the customer you know, right there for you to kind of tell them the origin story and and get them involved in the concept. Uh, Darren, Charlene, let everybody know where they can find you. Instagram, website, uh, where can they seek out the product? Um, Toss out some of your socials right now so people can follow you and your story. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram um, at the Fan Calf or Facebook. Um, We don't have a website yet. We didn't really think we needed one as a pop-up scene. We wanted to kind of be anonymous that way. (laughs) Um, But now we're building one because of the sausages. Um, We don't ship our sausages yet, unfortunately. Everyone's been asking about shipping. Actually, um, a lot of folks from New York have asked for it. Um, But we are not able to do it yet. The cost is just not not the best for consumers. And we don't want to sell it for hundred dollars and you just get one sauce, one pack. Right. So it's not fair. Um, but yeah, check us out. We'll have a website soon. Um, on our Instagram, you'll find out, you know, what our menu items are, how much they are, um, when we stock grocery stores and you're definitely going to see, uh, us expand. So when we're already in LA or wherever, that's really the best place to, to stay updated with our products. The line is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners just like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey, listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you.